Okay, well, why don't we get started? Um, first off, I want to say welcome. Uh, thank you for joining us this uh, beautiful early fall morning. It's definitely a crisp in the air uh, this week. Um, and thanks for joining us for our discussion on outdoor structures. Uh, my name is Eric Braun. Um, I'm director of design at our uh, the Chalet Landscape Division um, and registered landscape architect and happy to talk to you about all things outdoor structures. We'll cover as much as we can um, during our time here. Have a presentation um, to go along with things. You know, I'm gonna share my screen. I'll be up in the corner um, here. So why don't we get started? Um, so first off, uh, what are we going to cover during our time today? Um, first off, you know, we'll start with out types of outdoor structures. As we go through things, we'll talk about the various types. Um, also, there are different uses and strategies. There's a lot of options out there for outdoor structures. So we're gonna do the best we can. We'll cover about seven, uh, seven or eight of the main most common types of outdoor structures um, and kind of uh, all the details around those. Another thing we'll talk about as we go through is important considerations. Um, and then at the end, we'll uh, dive into a little bit more in depth with some of that when it comes to planning, permitting, budgeting, all those different factors that go into some of these things because the things that we're going to be talking about are features that can range from, uh, you know, 50 to to $100, no permits, you know, just pick it up at the store, plop it in, uh, good to go versus things that are construction projects, uh, you know, much more uh, larger budget, larger time frame of construction and installation and design, et cetera, et cetera. So we'll talk about some of that too. And as we go through each one, uh, we'll have photos and examples of what we're talking about. Um, I'll kind of, you know, describe a little bit of what we're seeing in each photo um, as we go through. And then one of the you know main things I want to do is have some question and answer at the end. Um, so as we go through things, if you have questions, please type them in the comment box. Uh, there is a Q&A box as well. Um, if you can, the comment box will be able to be seen by everyone. So um, I think that'd be a best, better option for sharing your questions if possible, but I'll keep an eye on the Q&A box as well in case some questions get typed in there. So we'll go through things, uh, the presentation and the discussion, and then um, I'll go through all those questions at the end and hopefully have answers to all of your questions. Um, so. So um, the most common types of outdoor structures that we're going to cover today. First off, we'll talk about pergolas. Uh, when we talk, when we use the term outdoor structures, that's probably what a lot of people uh, think of and first comes to mind. You can see some example photos up there on the top right and uh, the bottom right of pergola, you know, features or portions of pergolas. Then on that uh, upper uh, middle photo, that's actually a lattice uh, work, a wire cable lattice that has vines growing on it just as a nice, um, almost a trellis feature there. Um, we'll talk about arbors and trellises as well, talk about the difference of, of the two. A lot of people get those uh, two terms uh, mixed up. So kind of go along like the definition of them and then some photos and how those are used and utilized in the landscape. Decks, uh, very popular, um, and also a industry that has transformed a lot in the last uh, 10 years or so with uh, new materials and, and upgrading technology um, in regards to the materials. Fire pits and fireplaces, we're you know, launching into fall. That's prime fire season uh, for gathering around the fire pit and fireplaces. It's also something that's becoming um, more and more popular. We've had a lot of uh, calls and designs and projects utilizing fire pits or fireplaces, either permanent or uh, temporary or movable, I should say. Um, sheds as well. There's uh, a lot of options out there for sheds, whether it be strictly utilitarian or something that is uh, more decorative and you know utilized as a kind of a feature in the landscape. Garden decor, that's a very broad topic, but can cover a lot of interesting things. Um, and I say interesting because that's where a lot of uh, just uh, eye-catching features can be utilized in the landscape. And then walls and fencing, uh, often used for um, you know, very utilitarian purposes, but can be designed in, uh, in a way that it is a feature in the landscape and not just something that is you know a divider. Um, so we'll cover all of that. 
And then to start off, we've got the uh, general uses of outdoor structures. Um, as we go through these things, there's a lot of different uses for these different features, but in general, they kind of fall into these main categories. Um, first off, uh, functional. There tends to be some type of overarching function uh, to any of these site features. Um, and beyond that, then you get into some of these other um, uses of these um, structures. So privacy and screening, of course, is one, um, especially with things like fencing and, and walls, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, even uh, trellises and things like that could be used for privacy and screening. Feelings of enclosure, some of the other things that we're gonna talk about, um, not only, um, you know, are, are functional in the way, but also create a sense of enclosure or a kind of subconscious uh, just feeling of security um, and comfort. So that's uh, something as well that these are utilized for. And framing views is a huge thing. You can see, for example, that bottom left photo, how the walls are used and that walkway there, that blue stone walkway are, are being used to frame that view towards that beautiful ornamental uh, pot and planter. Um, so uh, some of these features we're talking about will, are can be utilized uh, to do just that and draw your eye towards um, some other feature or view. And focal points. Um, a lot of these features, if they're done right and designed uh, in a very attractive way, can be used to draw your eye to them um, and used as a focal point in the landscape. Um, architectural or aesthetic interest. Um, a lot of the, some of these features, especially pergolas and things like that, um, are by nature are an architectural feature. They're a, a built structure that um, oftentimes you'd want to have complement the style of the home, or uh, maybe there's a certain reason why you're going to go a totally different direction um, with the structure and, and do a different style in a different area of the property or something like that. Um, and then aesthetic interest, just something that is, um, visually appealing or interesting, especially when we get to the garden, um, the uh, garden decor and features and things like that, that gives you an opportunity to have some fun with it and you know make a space your own and kind of sprinkle in um, some elements of personality. And then gathering. Um, a lot of these features, especially fire pits, pergolas, um, things like that, are designed and intended to be the central feature in gathering spaces. Um, and um, especially nowadays, you know, with, uh, you know, people are stuck at home a, a lot, you know, for better or for worse. And um, having these kind of features to gather around and converse and spend time together um, is, is something that, uh, you know, these can be used for. So starting off uh, with pergolas, um, Many of you, you know, know what a pergola is, and but I, but what a lot of people don't know is uh, top right we have kind of the pergola terminology. Um, even some of these terms of what uh, things are labeled here go by uh, different names depending on who you're talking to or where you're from. But in general, um, you have the posts uh, and, you know, as the support, the main support structure, then the beams going uh, laterally across uh, to connect the posts. Then on top of that, uh, so, you know, when you're talking about a pergola, you have these layers um, and depending on the style and construction method and look and material, those layers um, can go a long way to um, add elements of design to a pergola. Um, also, you know, cost considerations and just construction method as well. Um, and you can see up at the top of that where it mentions those top runners, those are also known as purlins. Um, so you may hear that term if you're looking into uh, or talking with someone about pergolas. Um, so those purlins are kind of that nice little finishing touch along the top there. And all of these things can be spaced differently, uh, tighter together for more shade or, or more of a, um, a, a physical presence, um, or they can be spaced apart and very minimal in construction. And then that is therefore used more for just an aesthetic look um, or a just, um, you know, a, a use, used to define a space, not necessarily for shade in particular. Um, Common materials are your wood. Um, so you see, you, know, you can see bottom right those um, those decorative end end posts there and end cuts. Um, you know, constructed out of wood. Probably the most common material is uh, cedar used for pergolas. But uh, nowadays, you'll see a lot of metal uh, ones as well. It's more of a modern, contemporary look. That one bottom left um, is a karate uh, pergola. Um, so those uh, can also be you know enclosed. 
that is a uh, metal fabrication, and then uh, composite or PVC. Uh, this is one of the things where technology has come a long way and expanded the potential for materials um, uh, for these types of structures. So the second point on there I did wanted to mention, um, and I touched on it briefly just a moment ago, is um, shade versus the sense of enclosure. Um, so when people say they want a pergola, um, oftentimes they'll use that in the context of, you know, I have a very sunny patio and it's, it's just too sunny. We're baking out there, you know, in the summer when we're trying to have dinner. Um, so we need a pergola to provide some shade. Um, Pergolas by nature will provide some shade, but maybe not as much as you might think. Um, yeah, if you think about it, it's still an open, open ceiling. There are wood, uh, you know, beams and, and rafters coming across. Um, but especially in, you know, later in the season or in the day, um, even you're going to have the sun be, you know, low on the horizon and essentially coming in from the sides, um, you know, the sides here. Um, so when it comes to uh, pergolas, a lot of what you'll see nowadays, if you're truly looking for shade, is there will be um, uh, awnings that are either retractable, mechanical, or manual retractable awnings that can be on the sides. Oops, went forward here. It'll be on the sides or uh, like this particular one on the left has ones that can go down the sides. This has a solid roof so there's no need for that there but you can also you know we'll see some photos where they have awnings that go across the top to really provide that sense of shade. Um, now the um, other use for pergolas is to just provide a sense of enclosure. It's not necessarily physically providing shade or um, you know boxing you in, but having those beams, even if it's a few across the top and some of those posts to help define a space, when you're inside that pergola or under it, you naturally feel more enclosed and more comfortable and confined. So there's a very real kind of subconscious um, and physiological use for uh, pergolas as well. An architectural style, lots of times you'll want to tie these into the architectural style of the home. Um, that's, you know, kind of a, is a natural uh, thing that you would want to do. Um, and a lot of these are, uh, you know, customizable. And, uh, you know, nowadays uh, there's so many add-ons. You could do lighting, you can do electrical, you can have, you know, fans up top in the center. You could have uh, AV, you know, audio and visual. You can have TVs mounted in the corners. You can have speakers. Um, heaters so that you can even extend the uh, seasonal use even more throughout in late into the fall and early into the spring and create a warm uh, warmer area to to join so there's a lot of add-ons nowadays that uh, weren't necessarily available 10 15 years ago um, that go into pergola design and then uh, a few examples here um, so top left you can see um, the pergola here on that was the same photo in the previous slide with those decorative end cuts. And you can see this one does not have any of those purlins, um, those you know uh, skinny uh, wood rails along the top. This is one has just beams and joists going across, so a simplified construction. Um, but you can see how that creates that sense of enclosure when you're in with this in this space. Um, then bottom left, uh, just a beautiful pergola. This one does have that retractable awning uh, that I mentioned before. So you can see it has this track that runs across the middle. Um, this particular one can't tell, but it may be motorized or just manual, uh, you know, to pull uh, like a shade basically across the top. Um, and you can see, obviously they are not going to want, uh, you know, shades across the sides because you don't want to block that beautiful view. Um, but here's where we're also talking about a sense of enclosure. Um, you could imagine if this pergola weren't here on that bottom left hand corner, when you walk out onto that patio, it's gonna feel like the sky is, is endless and the outdoor space is endless. And what the pergola does there is creates a nice middle point, um, just of a, a feeling of slight enclosure. Um, and so you're not feeling so exposed uh, when you're out on that patio. Um, so that's a good example of that. Um, bottom right is definitely kind of a, a more whimsical uh, looking uh, pergola, if you want to call it that, almost like a folly, um, which you may have uh, maybe familiar with that terminology, but it's basically a central focal point along a, a walkway that goes through this boxwood hedge. So a area to basically kind of stop as you walk through that space, look up at the decorative, um, decorative structure, um, could have a small little table and chairs up there. Um, and then bottom right, 
you can see this pergola was added onto this pool house. And pergolas can also be utilized for climbing vines um, and structures, um, especially if you're looking to do something like a wisteria or a trumpet vine, uh, something that's very aggressive um, and grows very quickly and is actually very strong once it starts to mature. Um, for things uh, like wisteria and trumpet vine, pergolas are going to be a recommended structure because smaller structures literally could be um, destroyed by uh, the actual vine itself as it grows and thickens. And just a couple other examples here. Um, you know, a lot of different styles, some more traditional on the right. Um, a lot of these you'll see have these uh, decorative columns uh, as the main support for the pergola itself. Um, and then ones that are more uh, formal in this bottom left uh, is obviously a very formal and Italianate as the climbing vines and the, the sculptures to go along with it. That's one that is more, uh, you know, to be viewed. It's almost almost a trellis essentially, but um, that one's more to be viewed, but you can walk through it and, and spend some time in it. And this one as well, top left, um, is more of a urban environment. You can see some taller buildings uh, nearby. Um, and in urban environments and rooftop gardens and thing like things like that where you can feel like people are looking down on you or um, or that you know just opens up the sky opens up to a very large building that's right in your view the pergola is going to help bring that viewpoint down and draw your eye more down towards the the, the ground plane that you're on versus walking out and looking straight up at at windows or or the sky so that helps create a nice feeling of intimacy there uh, and then wanted to show this slide just a couple of examples of uh, metal or steel uh, framework for pergolas these are more modern and urban um, style uh, of design and architecture, but something we're seeing you know, more and more as people um, you know, in Chicago or other urban areas, and even in, on the North Shore, um, we've worked on rooftop projects where uh, they're utilizing the deck or the, uh, an upper deck or roof as another outdoor space. And a lot of builders and architects and designers um, have uh, really grabbed onto that and are designing you know, new homes and buildings with that in mind. Um, one thing I want to make sure to mention, uh, because it's very important for pergolas and especially rooftop structures, is um, knowing how the roof and the structure is designed and what, ki what kind of weight um, and load it is designed to carry. Um, retrofitting after the fact uh, with pergolas and rooftop structures um, can be um, uh, uh, quite an undertaking just from a, an engineering standpoint and permitting standpoint. So there's something to keep in mind that I wanted to mention, but we'll get more into some of that uh, later on. Um, then moving on to decks. Um, and again, just want to mention too, with the, the questions and things like that, we'll get to those uh, towards the end. So we'll go through the presentation and then I will be sure to uh, circle back around on some of these slides as we go through the questions later on. Uh, decks. So. Common materials, uh, your most common are going to be wood. Uh, cedar is uh, tends to be the, the general um, default uh, from a wood standpoint. Um, lots of times the actual understructure will be uh, larger um, uh, timbers and things of, out of pine. Um, cedar um, it has great uh, um, mold and rotting resistance, um, you know, can be stained or painted or just left natural. It'll be a, a brighter brown when it's first installed, but then as it ages naturally um, with the sun and the UV rays and as it ages, it'll turn a nice gray color. Um, so it's a nice adaptable wood surface material. Then I did want to talk about composite um, a little bit because that's a technology that has come a long way in the last uh, 10 years. Um, the older composite materials, um, when that industry first started coming around, were um, you know, not the greatest. Um, they would you know, warp in extreme heat or couldn't handle a lot of weight on them uh, before they started to bend um, under weight. But the technology has come a long way. Nowadays, you have materials that have lifetime warranties. Um, at, at least 30 year to lifetime warranties, um, they will not um, mold or mildew or rot at all. Um, they do not stain if they get um, some uh, markings on them from tree leaves coming down or some slight surface staining. All you need to do is power wash um, or, or kind of scrub them a little bit and they're as good as new. Um, that technology has come a long, long way. Um, they're great materials. 
Um, you do get what you pay for. I did want to mention that, you know, they're the, the composite industry. There are, you know, lower tier, mid tier and upper tier uh, of quality of materials. So if you're considering composite, please keep that in mind. And therefore cost, you know, kind of goes, you know, from the, uh, there's a, a wide range depending on the, uh, the quality or material or the collection that you're um, ordering from. Um, and then, um, so therefore price, you know, fluctuates quite a bit too. Uh, Composite's definitely going to be uh, considerably more expensive than wood, but the trade-off there is it's a higher upfront cost, but the maintenance and the durability um, and lifespan far um, outweighs uh, any type of wood decking. With wood, you're going to have, um, and don't get me wrong, cedar is a, a great material. We do those all the time, but there is some maintenance that goes in with that, with staining, you know, every couple of years or, you know, over, it does have a lifespan. So, boards can, you know, over time rot and, and things like that. So uh, then when it comes to the rails, similarly, it's been a lot of, um, a lot of evolution in the materials and the construction, wood uh, composite materials and aluminum and, and then even steel cable, which we'll uh, see a photo of in a minute, are all uh, material options for rails. Um, and it kind of, we kind of touched on some of the pros and cons with some of the materials, uh, primarily lifespan, maintenance, um, maintenance considerations, and just cost are some of those things that you need to factor in when you're looking to install or design a deck and your, uh, you know, design professional or uh, contractor or carpenter can help you navigate um, some of those, uh, some of those questions to come up with the right uh, decision for you and your space. Um, and one of the main um, reasons or one of the best reasons to have uh, to use a deck in your landscape is if you have a difficult area. Um, so that bottom right hand photo, you can tell or maybe you can't tell, but the ground slopes down quite considerably. <clears throat> if you're dealing with um, a property or area that um, has a heavy slope or has air conditioners or um, you know other things that just make the space not easily usable, decks can be a great option to create, you know, hundreds of feet of usable space. So um, if you have a underutilized area of your property out the back or, you know, or somewhere uh, that you've always wanted to turn it into a usable area, decks could be an option. And then similar, like we mentioned with the pergolas, a lot of uh, new technology nowadays, especially um, with a lot of these things, the the evolution of LED fixtures in the landscape um, and just uh, everywhere in general has really opened up a lot of doors uh, to utilizing these, uh, to utilize lighting in a lot of these features. Um, you can see that top right photo has lighting integrated into those posts um, along the railings. Uh, it's a nice feature there. Um, and I did want to mention from a per permitting standpoint, again, kind of recurring theme here with these things. Um, look into uh, you'll need to look into your villages and how they treat uh, decks some of them treat them as um, what we'll call hardscape or you know the same as like a driveway or a patio as in as in water uh, as an impermeable space um, so that in some villages that will add towards your square footage coverage for the property other villages do not other villages consider them um, just a you know, separate from any type of hardscape structure, which is, is great because then you can uh, utilize additional, um, you know, additional hard, essentially hardscape space without having to count against you from a zoning and, and permitting stance. Um, so then here's a couple more photos, um, just some deck examples. You can see on the left, there's that cable rail that we were talking about. So essentially it's basically wound steel cable. Um, very cool look, very slick. And as you can see, allows you to see uh, through the rail much more, especially if you have views out the back. Those can also come in vertical uh, cables as well. The vertical option actually is significantly less expensive uh, than the horizontal. Reason being when you have those steel cables, um, it's common permitting uh, to not have to not uh, to not allow a four inch sphere uh, to pass through any type of rail. And you could imagine if you're using a wound cable, the tension that is required to keep those rails so tight um, actually can start to pull um, the structure of the rail, you know, and have a lot of force behind it. So therefore, those rails need to be really strong. Um, and the vertical option 
um, doesn't have as much tension on it. So there's you know a little bit less expensive from a construction uh, standpoint. Center photo, you can see some um, integrated lighting in those steps there. Great for safety, um, you know, um, it light up at night. And these actually have also integrated LED lights in the post caps on the on the posts. So lots of options there. And then just on the right, just showing a nice um, example where you can really see that wood grain. That's a composite material, but um, that's one of the really nice ones where it really has a nice wood grain and actual texture to it. If you were to look at it and, and feel it, it would feel and look a lot like wood. Some of the lower tier composites will have less um, uh, physical graininess to them and texture and also less realistic looking uh, wood grain. Those are some of the things that go into the, the pricing differences on those different levels of composite. And arbors and trellises. Um, so I wanted to start off, like I mentioned, um, just uh, with some definitions. Uh, so a trellis in general is going to be flat. Um, it's something that you, you'll usually see mounted up on a wall. Um, they can be freestanding um, on a couple of you know posts, but typically you'll see them up against something. And an arbor um, is what you'll see in the photo there. You can see it has some depth. So uh, you know it's three-dimensional. It's something you kind of walk through. Um, those are the easiest way to kind of um, you know determine whether you're talking about an, a trellis or an arbor. Again, some of the same common materials, wood, metal, and composite. That one on the right in particular is uh, you know, made out of wood. Um, has a nice little gate there as well. Very decorative, very you know, kind of cottagey feel to it, especially with the climbing vine on top there. And this one's a good example of uh, using an arbor um, as a quote unquote garden door. Um, it's a great way to um, create kind of a subliminal feeling of entering or leaving a space um, and also utilizing them to frame views. You know, if this, um, if you're standing in front of this particular gate, for example, and if there, as you look through that kind of upper half, if there's something beyond that, that you're, you know, let's say a focal point plant material or a specimen plant or something like that, that pergola, or I'm sorry, <laughs> not pergola, arbor is really going to uh, help frame that view and draw your attention to it. Um, and then, yeah, like we mentioned, you know, great for vines and climbers, as you can see. Um, lots of times a, a arbor or trellis um, that is just kind of there by itself almost looks unfinished or, or empty. So uh, vines or climbing uh, plant material go a long way to help finish that look. A um, couple examples, you know, that one on the left is a, a very extensive arbor. Um, you can see the wisteria, beautiful uh, growing on it. But that is, you know, creates the feeling of a tunnel. Um, and you can see how your eye is naturally drawn towards that, that end there. So if you were to have, you know, obviously they are intending to have your eye look beyond and into that open, you know, the open field or whatever that view is beyond. But if you're using it in a more residential scale, you could have a shorter um, arbor with a statue or some kind of focal point here and your eye is going to be immediately carried towards that um, at the end. And up on the right got um, a nice trellis, um, a nice trellis incorporated with some fencing and walls but you can see here really is where it you know, makes you feel like you're entering a backyard space and kind of that garden door like we mentioned. And then bottom right just a couple of examples of uh, just simple trellises uh, used uh, to break up that face of that garage. Um, you, know, you can see the little piece of uh, artwork up there as well. But you can imagine in that you know, beautiful garden space, beautiful, beautiful intimate backyard space, if those uh, trellises weren't there, you'd be staring at a very just blank wall kind of right in your face. So those uh, do a great job of breaking that up visually. And just a couple more examples um, you can see here. This one uh, in particular, you know, it draws your eyes towards that focal point and that gathering space of a bench there. And in this photo, it's just a good example of how your eye is naturally drawn back towards that uh, that arbor and that bench there. You know, you're, you're, it's a beautiful uh, composition overall, um, but your eye isn't ne necessarily drawn towards this one boxwood here or this lamb's ear down in front. It's, you know, with along with the path is carrying your eye right towards that um, area. And then just call a couple other examples of some beautiful um, beautiful trellises and arbors um, with climbing plant material on them. 
fire pits and fireplaces. This is something that has uh, become more and more popular. Um, and like I said, uh, for those of you that join us uh, that weren't there right at the beginning, you know, it's fall now. Um, uh, you know, I've, I've, I'm wearing wearing my jacket outdoors right now because it definitely is chilly and, you know, it's it's fire pit season or fireplace season uh time to get outside and extend that outdoor uh time of the year um typically fire pits are either going to be wood burning or gas um they do have the uh, kind of like wood burning uh pellets there's that option but typically you're going to have wood burning or gas um portable or permanent there's a lot of portable fire pits out there. Um, some of them are really nice, really stylish. Um, so that's always an option or, you know, permanent, more fixed and built structures are the other way to go with that. Um, a lot of different options for materials, uh, basically any of your common building materials, brick, stone, metal, concrete, or boulders. And we'll see a couple of examples of, of each of those. And one of the main things about a fire pit and fire or fireplace, um, just to be clear, you know, on the top photo there, that's a fire pit. And then the bottom is, you know, an outdoor fireplace. Um, but in general, what they're all going to do is create a destination in a gathering space. These can be things that are um, outside your back door at, you know, a patio area and integrated there, or they can be set off into the distance, you know, kind of tucked into a, a you know, a farther corner of the property or somewhere in the backyard to create essentially a, a destination uh, and a place to to go to that is, you know, farther away from the home and creating that sense of, of separation. The nice thing about that as well is if it is something that as you look out the back of your home and see, um, you know, your, your uh, fire pit and patio out towards the back, nice plantings around it, that's something that's really going to um, draw your eye and create visual interest throughout the year, even when it's not being actually used. Um, the particular one up top there is a very natural and informal fire pit. Um, I love that look. It's got just using uh, large Eden outcropping boulders as the actual uh, structure and then bluestone chip as the infill. And this particular one has a, a fire ring inside of it, inside the bluestone chip. Um, so, and it's gas fed. So when you turn it on and light it, you know, the fire looks as if it's coming out of the bluestone chip. Um, beautiful look. And then the bottom right is absolutely beautiful um, outdoor fireplace uh, built with um, aqua, was it aqua grantique uh, stone. It's a very dark uh, natural stone out of the East Coast, but that's a, a beautiful look. And, you know, some, a larger structure like that is going to generate, you know, a good amount of heat which is great in a large area. Um, then I did want to mention, especially with this too, with I mentioned with pergolas and then also with fire in general, you know, I always be safe with the fire. Um, so that is something also that um, cities and villages definitely want to make sure that it's a safe structure. So there's going to be zoning and permitting considerations for something like that. If it's a portable fire pit, those are, you know, a little more DIY. You can kind of put those where you want. Always, you know, be safe and don't put it in your structures <clears throat> like your home or something like that. But if you're going to actually be constructing it and having a designer, you know, design one and build one, uh, the zoning and um, permitting is going to have to be a consideration. Typically, you'll need to have these types of features at least 10 to 15 feet from other built structures. Um, so, you know, when you're thinking about, oh, I'd love to put a fire pit under a pergola, it could be a problem there. Um, a lot of villages won't necessarily um, allow that. Um, you will see some with uh, fireplaces integrated with pergolas and those are treated a little bit differently because you have the actual uh, chimney portion above the top level of the pergola. So those are you know, treated differently. But these are you know, more of the reasons why you hire a professional to design these things. You know, they're familiar with the permitting and the safety requirements for these kinds of things and can also give you some guidance on what um, is realistic versus what uh, you maybe you would you know, love to do in your wildest dreams, but maybe unfortunately cannot, but hopefully you can. Um, a couple other examples, um, you can see top right, beautiful, a really nice, you know, more of a modern linear look. Linear fire pits in general are, are definitely trending, definitely um, seeing a, uh, not even necessarily a resurgence, but a um, more um, people wanting those, um, they're becoming more and more popular. Um, you can see very sleek, uh, sleek look there. Looks great with, you know, rectangular couches and things like that with outdoor furniture uh, around it. 
bottom left, uh, again, another beautiful um, outdoor fireplace. <clears throat> this one has, you know, the television mounted up top. It's integrated with a pergola structure around it uh, as well. Um, you know, dining tables and things like that, uh, really creating a really inviting space. And then this bottom right one, um, <clears throat> nice limestone coping, utilizing black uh, glass, or maybe that, that might be lava rocks, hard to tell. Um, but um, for the infill too, that's another consideration nowadays. You can do your, you know, kind of traditional lava rock, but what's really popular nowadays if you're doing gas fed is uh, colored glass. Um, you can do all kinds of different colors. It, it can stand the heat of the fire. Um, you know, but this is a, a beautiful look and you can see how this fireplace is intentionally placed right along this main axis here outside these windows. So you can imagine if you put yourself inside this room and are looking outward, you know, you're looking over the pool, um, then out towards the fire pit and out towards that fire pit patio area, something that's going to be beautiful to look at from the indoors um, as well. And a couple just other examples. Um, one thing I wanted to show is this bottom right one. <clears throat> one thing that um, is becoming a bit more popular nowadays um, is this board form concrete look. So this is where uh, these uh, fire pits are, or other structures, you could do it with seat walls, benches, all of this, um, but fire pits, and we've done a few that turned out fantastic, where they use the wood framing for the concrete pour and no other kind of surface treatment. So what you're left with then when the framing is removed is that really cool uh, texture where you can see the wood grain. You can see, you know, the, the fire, um, not the fire, the uh, concrete. Oh, you can see the concrete, you know, where some of that concrete has, you know, seeped a little bit into the joints between those fr the framing. Um, just a, a really slick look that is uh, a really nice look if you have a kind of a more modern or contemporary style. And then top, top right, having a nice thermal blue stone patio with kind of that checkerboard um, square pattern and then a nice limestone fire pit to go along with it. I uh, wanted to talk on sheds because uh, sheds, um, again, are something that have come a long way um, with technology and different options nowadays. Um, they can be prefabricated. The most common ones that we deal with are Pine Harbor or Walpole, um, and then uh, Tough Shed is another one that you may be familiar with. And then you can always go uh, with custom carpentry. You know, carpenters can build sheds to match the architectural style of your home, create almost a little cottage, you know, cottagey look. You know, there's, you know, she sheds, um, greenhouses or potting sheds, you know, outdoor reading rooms or um, play, you know, playhouses essentially for children that could also act as, you know, those, you know storage areas. Really, the possibilities are endless. You can see even just here, two totally different looks, one with the angled roof line, you know, and a door and windows, looks like more of an outdoor kind of office or reading room type space. And then that one on the bottom right, you know, has doors and that ramp, you know, for, you know, storage of lawnmowers or equipment or tools, whatever it may be. Um, but it's, you know, designed to look like a nice little cottagey uh, feel and almost like a mini home. Uh, and utilizing that as an architectural feature. And then just a couple more options. Um, you know, this bottom left, utilizing it uh, like a potting shed and almost a little greenhouse. It's got that, uh, that greenhouse roof on it. Nice barn doors out the right side there. And, you know, of course, a little cute uh, planters as well. <clears throat> and then some of the others. Um, one thing I did want to note too, with a lot of uh, sheds in general, whether they're prefab or um, you know uh, custom carpentry, lots of times you'll see ramps leading up to them, and, and there's a reason for that, is especially with prefab, um, whether they're going to be on a concrete foundation or on a compacted gravel base, they usually are going to need to be actually elevated because the actual you know, base structure. Um, will be about you know four inches worth of you know either either a steel you know, metal framework or wood framework. So therefore, you need to have something to kind of compensate for that grade. So that's why you'll see ramps on some of these. On that top left one is kind of a newer um, option. There's a, a company called Enclave Outdoor Structures that are uh, starting to develop these modular um, outdoor structures, you know, very contemporary kind of modern look, but they're coming like eight by four panels and are highly customizable. So I just want to kind of show an example of that. Uh, then garden decor. So this is one um, just kind of a, 
a, a, a topic in general that um, you can have a lot of fun with. And it's, it's very broad. So um, garden decor can mean a lot of things. It could mean sculptures. It could mean some of these art, art, artwork, um, pots, you know, are considered garden decor fountains all of those different things kind of fit into this category but these are the 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 kind of accoutrement or the uh you know the finishing touches that really tie a space together and and make it more interesting um than if those pieces weren't there um you know i like to call them you know pieces of flair um because you know it really gives you the opportunity um as a homeowner to showcase your your style and your personality um these types of things when I'm when I'm working with uh, clients um, and they will ask about you know ornamental pots or or statues or sculpture um, or artwork especially it, it's such a personal choice and such a personal style thing that often um, will kind of set people on the right path or give them some um, some resources to look at but um, I like to uh, you know kind of leave that up to the client to really select that because it is. You know, my my personal choice and personal preference and style for artwork is going to be, you know, could very well be very different from um, the homeowners. So um, there's kind of that that give and take and that um, relationship with the designer and, and these finishing touches. Um, the nice thing about it as well is, especially with things like ornamental pots or um, artwork or you know, if you're having something up on a pedestal, um, is it's adaptable. If you uh, one year decide you want to have a cool color palette and have all your planters have, you know, purples and blues and, and whites and, and all that and, and love that look, but then the next year you want something, you know, hot and flashy and bright yellows and reds and oranges, then you can, you know, change that and it's totally adaptable. So that's one of the nice things. And that what that does too is creates a, uh, an evolutionary a space that has an evolution you know it's not the same year in year out and even from spring to fall um, you can change these things out and have it be a, a seasonal fluctuation and seasonal evolution um, and in this photo here um, you know you can see you've got you know some wind chimes outdoor you know just a fountain a little you know bench there um, just a couple of things that add a nice touch and if they weren't there you know would um, the space you know would be uh, much less interesting than it is with them. Um, so then uh, additional examples, you know, it can range from whimsical, you know, this is a, a, a monarch way station or like a, you know, a monarch um, little screened in area at a client's property. It's a very naturalistic, uh, you know, look and the whole property is like that. So this type of element totally fits in with that style and with that property, it's, it's you know, you know, cheeky, it's fun, it's colorful, it's eye-catching, and you know, it's a great um, addition. Then a couple examples of actual sculptures um, in the landscape. Down in the bottom here, one constructed out of stone uh, with some nice Hakone, gla Hakone grass along the base. Um, and then this one, um, which was a custom artwork piece uh, with a client of ours, and you know, we we, we wanted to show that as the the show piece and the statement piece of that front yard. Um, so as you can see the the planting palette and the planting design, the landscape design, very simple, very sleek with just a nice lawn panel, but uh, framed by this beautiful granite curbing. But um, you know, really the the um, sculpture itself is what people are going to look at, and it's located along two main axes. Axes, um, this one here as you're walking up uh, the driveway, but then as you're looking at the front door, or lo I'm sorry, looking through the front walkway as well. It's right along that main axis um, as well. So location is uh, location and, and um, siting is a consideration as well. And a couple examples of using ornamental pots as focal points and as garden decor and as you know structural pieces in the garden um, this particular one in the center is ex uh, particularly striking and at this in this particular location this is right outside the front door so as you walk out the front door and look across it has a, a horseshoe driveway so as you look across the driveway that is what is greeting your eye as you look out the front door and you can imagine you know in person how striking and how um, how visually your eye is drawn towards that beautiful um, arrangement in that ornamental pot. And again, those are things that can be changed out seasonally. Winter pots are my favorite, my personal favorite. Um, I just love that winter look in ornamental pots. And then on the right here, you have some 
um, you know, decorative lion sculptures incorporated with ornamental pots up on pedestals. So some nice uh, composition there. Then walls and fencing, there's a lot of options here. Um, materials, again, some of the same things uh, with this too, we're kind of, you can incorporate wrought iron as a common, um, common element to use for the materials. And walls and fencing in general can serve multiple purposes. Obviously they can be used for privacy and separation, um, but they can also be used to define spaces um, and um, you know, not necessarily for more of a strict functional use, but just to create that feeling of slight enclosure or a slight feeling of privacy and separation. Um, and it can also be just strictly functional from a wall standpoint, you know, if they're like that bottom photo is a retaining wall. So it is, you know, physically retaining that soil and compensating for grade change on a property in a way to, um, a way to solve uh, the grade change there in a safe manner. Um, but they also could be freestanding for seat walls for sitting on or to help frame a patio space with a seat wall around the border. Um, so multiple options for their actual use. That top right photo, um, <clears throat> something that is um, newer to the market and to the industry are these uh, metal panels that are essentially like um, you know, stamped out uh, either aluminum most commonly aluminum, but uh, you can see how cool of a look that is. They have different patterns on them. Some of them are, you know, all different shapes and sizes. Some of them are floral. Some of them are just, you know, random, interesting geometric patterns. But that's uh, something that's uh, been very interesting uh, to see in the industry um, as of late. <clears throat> and then a couple more example photos. So I'm going to take a drink here while we take a look. Um, <clears throat> that top left photo actually is the entrance gate from the previous photo where we saw that sculpture in the lawn panel. So you can see it just beyond the gate there, but you can see how this particular residence, you know, the fencing, those, um, those stone piers or columns, the artwork, all of those different pieces that, that granite curbing, you know, down in the front uh, and the new walkways, all of those pieces, um, have a you know certain style uh, to them, so um, you know it almost is a certain artistic look, even from a uh, a site features uh, standpoint. And then bottom left, uh, a nice low stone retaining wall um, used to you can see the gathering area up above, which is like an enclosed um, almost pergola porch structure, and then utilizing that low wall for a garden bed uh, to then go down to that lawn. Uh, lawn grade there. And then those two right side photos are at the same, are just taking different sides inside a, a uh, built cabana structure um, that has you know, outdoor television, fans, you know, uh, electrical, etc. But the walls themselves um, step up and down there. It's taller along the back here where there is um, some other, other things behind um, this wall that you're looking to disguise and then steps down lower on these two sides where is the direction where you're facing more outwards towards the garden on those three sides. So you're wanting to keep that um, view more open uh, as you're sitting in this space. A couple additional photos. Um, those two photos on the left are just natural stacked stone. Sorry, I got the, the sun coming over here. Um, our natural stacked stone uh, examples for walls. So these will be constructed either on a concrete base or a compacted gravel base. But you can see there's no mortar um, or anything holding them together. It's the, the, sheer, the sheer weight and size of the stones themselves that are um, holding back and supporting themselves. And typically that as you get taller, you'll need to step back the construction like this um, for structural stability. You can see both of these are not, um, you know, uh, straight vertical. They actually kind of step back. Um, and that is uh, intentional. Top right, you can see this low curved seat wall. It's used to enclose the space and create that little sense of enclosure and also some additional seating. Um, I also really like to recommend people, you know, putting some pots or other features on the seat wall. You know, if you have a nice ornamental pot on the end there of that seat wall, you can, you know, imagine that's going to be a nice prominent location to showcase something like that and add a lot of uh, visual interest. 
And then this bottom right, these were uh, a custom wall that we did um, at a property and it's intended to be a, a low wall and that was intentional to just create a, a, a slight sense of separation. You know, this is not something that's going to create privacy or a be a wall in your face, but basically be a transition between what we see bottom left is the driveway um, and just it's a simple ground cover planting around the driveway, but then that low wall and as you walk through it, um, is going to kind of create that subconscious feeling of entering a new space. Um, and also it is something that's going to create um, a, a, a design structure year round. So it's, you know, kind of a framework for that front yard outdoor space. And, you know, you have intentionally taller perennials and plantings behind it so that way you'll be able to see those peeking up over the wall. Just a couple more examples. There's there's tons of tons of options out there uh, between materials and design style and and just look and you know end cuts uh, on different posts. Different, uh, really, the options are endless. So you know, I could go on and on just about these. Um, and a lot of times you'll look towards the architecture of the house to kind of inform some of those decisions. If you have architect certain architectural features or style on the home, you'll often want to incorporate that into these features as well. You can see here, it's got a nice little vegetable garden to keep the, uh, the pesky creatures away from the vegetables and has this nice um, steel, it's often steel or sometimes nylon uh, wire mesh so you can see through that. Uh, but it is keeping keeping the animals out. And this is another little more informal vegetable garden area, a nice little flagstone stepper pathway and bluestone chip to go along with it. And so then I wanted to finish um, the presentation by showing uh, some photos of you know, the composition of these elements. Um, so when we, we have all these pieces and when you can utilize um, several of these pieces all in once, that's when you're going to get a really, really show-stopping space. Um, you know, it's it's one of those situations where the 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 sum is much greater than the or the I should say that the total is greater than the sum of its individual parts. Um, you know what I'm saying? Um, so. As you can see, this is a property that has a lot going on and a lot of these different features, uh, you know, beautiful large pergola, um, had to have very large beams um, to be able to support this length of an expanse. This is a very large pergola. Um, you can see it has, you know, a couple layers and it also had, you know, these purlins and the joists. So there's a lot of weight there. So therefore we needed larger joists and posts. You can see the, the fan, you know, in this nice gathering space. And then when you're in this main pergola space, so that's this right here, then you can see beyond how there's a smaller pergola and a little you know, bench area there, a little swinging bench. And it's hard to tell from this view, but this post here is actually a post and then cables running along for um, espalier, an espalier orchard. So it's got fruiting trees that are growing along this lattice work of steel cables. And then when you look at the aerial view, we also have fencing incorporated. That's a nice lattice fence about four, uh, four to five feet tall that's hiding um, you know, some air conditioning and some utilities and also a little vegetable area here. Oops. And then on the other side of things, we got a nice little fountain with roses around it. So all of these different pieces are working together to create a, a beautifully designed space and also one that is constantly evolving through the season. And it's kind of one of those things where there's always something new um, around each corner and that goes um, a long way towards designing a successful space. Uh, then here we saw, uh, you know, this example earlier, but I did want to circle back around to it because it is not a huge space, but it shows a beautiful composition of these different elements that we're talking about. You have your, your nice pergola, um, structural and architectural plantings to help frame things, nice boxwood hedges and some upright horn beams. This low wall um, with uh, accents, you could have some nice pots on these columns. You've got the outdoor fireplace, you know, so all of these things working together, uh, really making a, a beautiful backyard space. And then just a couple more showing, <clears throat> excuse me, showing 
uh, fire pit, you know, it's gas fed fire pit with these logs. You can see the, the fire brick uh, lining the inside there um, from a masonry uh, side of things that those will go on the inside because it's a, a type of clay and brick that is extremely um, heat resistant. Um, so you'll need you ha have those lined the inside of the fire pit, but working in conjunction with the outdoor furniture and the outdoor pergola and the brick and bluestone and having that nice composition of elements and materials. Here's just a nice one with some walls, uh, nice fencing, and you know, of course, that piece of flair. There's that beautiful piece of artwork that you know I'm sure was you know selected you know by the homeowner, and it it speaks to them for whatever reason, um, but is very meaningful for them, and they want to showcase that in that backyard space. And then the composition. We saw this photo earlier, but it's very nice um, with uh, the pergola up above, nice uh, raised planters. Uh, decorative fencing, you know, that's one that you can, with fencing, you can have it be, you know, very see-through if it's a lattice or that wire that, you know, that cable that we saw earlier. Um, or if you're looking for really privacy and, and more of a solid screen, then you can, you know, do something like this. And it even has that little kind of custom uh, piece in the center. You can see that little light actually mounted up there as well that in the evening is going to cast, um, you know, soft light down on to highlight that um that feature there and that's uh that carpentry which is beautiful so then i did want to touch on another kind of looked through things um is the zoning considerations because with a lot of these features um you'll need to consider things or the village will consider things um, like setbacks from the property line or setbacks from uh, the home or other structures or neighboring structures um heights obviously things with fencing uh, most village uh, pretty much all villages universally have maximum heights typically that is uh, six feet um, and typically most villages will treat backyards and front yards differently so they may have different uh, height restrictions for heights for fencing and also uh, percentage uh, visibility through them um, fencing another consideration is if you're on a corner lot from a safety standpoint in front yards um, to make sure, uh, you know, as you're pulling out of the driveway or uh, cars are taking turns around corners that, you know, any kids on bikes or people walking nearby, you know, that there's that those visual sight lines. Um, <clears throat> materials are an important consideration. Um, a lot of these things, the di depending on what material, there's two ways to go about it. You can either, you know, the material you choose may factor into the construction methods or and or cost and or um, then the other, uh, the other consideration is the actual design of it may necessitate the materials chosen. You know, if um, if you have a very large pergola or let's say a small pergola and you want it to be wood, that's fantastic. If you want a very large pergola and want it to still be wood, that can be done, but it's going to usually need a steel framework that is actually capped in wood. Um, so that goes into the construction methods um, and things like that as well. Um, budgeting, like we mentioned uh, early on, uh, some of these things like, you know, you could get trellises for, you know, 50 to a hundred dollars or, you know, spend, you know, several hundreds and, and, you know, and thousands of dollars on things like pergolas and walls and fencing. And a lot of that is going to go into the, the material considerations and uh, length and, and size of the overall site feature. Um, when you're working with a professional, they can usually give you some, some rough budget ranges. Um, decking in particular, just so you are aware, can have a very wide range of, of budgets. It's very hard to narrow down necessarily a, a square footage, you know, price because virtually every every deck is different um, depending on how many steps you're going to have down, how large of a footprint it is, what the material is. Is it going to be multi-level? Is it all flat or the rail style there there's so many options there that it um you know it's something just to kind of you know take a look at a backyard and say oh you're gonna you know you know spend it's gonna be twenty thousand dollars for a deck here it's it's very difficult to do but um and then a proper location and siding on your property we kind of talked a little bit about this as we went through things but depending on the site feature you're going to use it for different reasons um Fencing, you know, is often going to be used for privacy or, or separation of spaces. So if you're on a new property and looking to site your fence, then you're going to want to think about, okay, how are, how are we going to use this 
property where if i'm going to separate the front and the backyard where does that make the most sense in in how i'm using the space um do i need solid fencing along the backyard because i want privacy whereas in the front uh, you know the the uh portion from the front to the back i want it to be more decorative and more uh more um you know, informal, so more cottagey look, you know, so there's a lot of considerations there. Um, and we talked about a few of those things such as fire pits or fireplaces and, and pergolas and some of those things that um, really need to think about. Um, so the key with all of these is, you know, doing your research, hire a professional, hire a designer who can answer some of these questions or at least, um, you know, absolutely steer you in the right direction or um, educate you on, you um, like the things that you want to do, yes, that all sounds perfect. Or I, I hear the things that you you want to do, and we may not be able to do all of them for reasons X, Y, and Z. But here's how we can accommodate that and incorporate these uh, to the best of um, you know your your wants and needs, and um, come up with a great solution. Um, Another thing I wanted to mention too, uh, going back to pergolas as well, is uh, villages will treat those differently um, a lot of times too. Um, some villages consider those essentially an addition to the house. So then you're looking at um, FAR or floor area ratio calculations and things like that. Um, others um, will treat them differently, whether they're attached to the house versus out uh, you know and detached and its own element out in the out in the yard space um some of these things are allowed are not allowed in front yards um some of these are depending on the village so uh, when you're starting to think about a project and really this goes across the board even if you're not thinking about outdoor structures is do some research you know call up the village call up your community development department call up the building department whichever your town may have and ask just a few um, exploratory questions on some of these things and how um, they treat uh, these types of uh, features. Um, so that way you can be set up for success and not go down down a path and have your heart set on you know have your heart set on something and ready to pull the trigger and find out you can't do it. Um, that's always the the worst outcome possible. Um, okay, so now thank you very much uh, for. Uh, kind of going through that with me. I'm going to open up the uh, field to some questions. So I am going to stop my screen share here real quick. Okay, so we have, I'll just start right at the top. So we've got a question from Liz. Um, so if you have a pergola with vines, will plant pieces fall down on you? And is there a lot of cleanup? Um, it's really going to depend on the type of vine uh, that's chosen. In general, uh, vines by nature aren't terribly messy. Um, you may have, uh, you know, flower petals or or fruit if it's a, a fruiting vine or something like that that uh, can fall down. Uh, in general, that's not a, a huge concern, so I wouldn't let that stand in the way of um, of you doing that. Also, it depends on how aggressive uh, the vine is and the type of plant that you've chosen. So um, a lot of time, you know, usually you'll need to start the vine down at the post. Um, so down at the base and it'll start to climb up, you know, over the course of, um, you know, a couple of years. And then if it's a hardy vine and, you know, lives uh, throughout the winters and you know, continues to grow, it'll eventually probably go towards the top. Um, but it really depends on the type. You know, we saw wisteria and, and I mentioned trumpet vine earlier, which are very um, aggressive and get very, you know, large structures. Whereas if you're doing something like a, clemat a clematis, a sweet autumn clematis or something like that, more dainty, more dainty will probably get up, you know, up the post and start to kind of go over the corners a little bit. But it will never get to the point where it's covering the entire the entire um, structure itself. So it really depends on the the uh, plant chosen, but I, I wouldn't be too concerned about that as far as things falling down or, or the plants being messy. What tends to be more of a concern with that is actually trees up above with all the, the leaves falling and, and things like that. Um, or, you know, if you're under an oak and have acorns, you know, dive bombing you <laughs> and things like that. Um, and then uh, MJ Cohen, um, so how are the aluminum panels installed? Do they need concrete footing or are they considered fencing? 
<clears throat> um, great question, and, and there's a uh, different ways you can do it. If those aluminum panels are being incorporated into a fence, uh, then yeah, they can be anchored to uh, the posts, which can be wood or can be metal. Any type of post you're usually going to want to anchor into concrete. Um, that's going to give it the structural stability. You know, in, in Chicagoland, we're blessed with a horrific freeze thaw um, cycle every winter. Um, so, and what that does is makes things move as in the, in the fall and in the spring, as you're, you know, freezing and then thawing and freezing and thawing, um, any water that is in the soil is going to just constantly be pushing and moving things around. So um, if it's a small little trellis or small metal panel, sometimes you, those will have basically like spikes that you can just kind of, you know, step on and push into the ground, but you're going to need to be basically kind of resetting those essentially each, each spring after that freeze thaw cycle. Uh, finishes, but um, if you're looking for something more permanent, um, any fence that is installed is going to have concrete uh, or posts that are in concrete, um, and so that there's that structural stability. Um, then, uh, Liz, what ideas do you like for screening generators and AC units? Um, <clears throat> so, uh, several good options, uh, as you know, the previous. Uh, commenter uh, mentioned those aluminum panels are a great option um, that uh, can be just you know uh, we have them at our store and we'll met you can get some of those panels they're nice decorative uh, a great look and can go you know down into the ground around air conditioning units um, from a fencing standpoint lots of times we'll do um, low like four foot fencing around air conditioning units or other utilities um, lots of times if we use a, a nice lattice you know a framework of solid wood but then lattice um, for the panels themselves that's a nice look that still allows airflow uh, through it for air conditioners and things like that but is just a nice uh, gardeny look and, and keeps those things kind of out of sight whenever there are utilities nearby. Uh, we always are trying to screen those one way or the other. Uh, the other option, of course, is to have plantings. You, know, you could do upright boxwood or upright yews or or evergreens around those air conditioning units to um, disguise those and kind of keep those out of sight. Um, do climbing plants on wall trellises break down brick? Um, it's a good question, and I have heard both sides of this argument for um, a long time. <laughs> um, so, um, typically, what you're going to uh, going to want to consider is is what is the vine. Vines are going to typically um, mount themselves or anchor themselves in a couple of different ways. One is with tendrils, where um, the the vine actually needs something to, to climb onto and, and will, you know, use that structure to climb. So that's when you're often going to need something like a trellis or some kind of lattice work for those tendrils to kind of grab onto and then climb up. Um, Another way is actually these almost like little suckers that basically anchor on um, themselves to the structure. So that with that, you're talking about like ivy, um, you know, grapevines, things like that, where they literally, you know, mount themselves onto the brick. Um, and I apologize, I don't have a exact answer for you because I've heard differing accounts even from uh, masons and, and things like that is some, some say that, the greens, you know, the, the vines and things help regulate temperature, um, which, because uh, uh, a lot of temperature variation can, can pop mortar or, you know, even damage brick or, or moisture over time. And others have said, um, yeah, you know, if you have ivy and things like that on the brick that it can do damage over time. Um, so I wish I had an exact answer for you, but I don't. Um, but as far as sealing, um, I don't, you wouldn't need to necessarily seal the brick. Uh, the vines themselves in general are not uh, by nature strong enough to actually like, you know, get into the mortar and start to really rip it apart or separate it. They're just mounted on the surface and are, are climbing upward. So, um, and a lot of people just love that look too, you know, having a you know beautiful brick home with uh, ivy, you know, growing up it. I know even as a kid, that was like one of my dream house uh, you know, must haves was, you know, ivy climbing up <laughs> a brick wall. Um, see, and then we have a couple questions in the Q&A. And if you have questions, uh, you know, additional questions, please keep typing them here. 
Okay, and then we have a question from Noreen. Uh, do you work with sunken hot tubs or cocktail pools? Um, yes, uh, we, we, so we have done some of those. Um, and, uh, you know, like I mentioned before, the zoning considerations, um, just, you know, when you're dealing with a, a sunken hot tub, you're dealing with something that is, is down below ground. So therefore, you're gonna have to think about drainage. Um, and, you know, during rains or just on any given day, how is that, sunken um, area that the hot, hot tub is in going to drain. Um, water is always, always a consideration with, with any project and, and what to do and how to address water on your property. Um, so something like that, we abs you absolutely can do and we absolutely have done. Um, and there just is a, you know, you'll, you'll definitely want to talk with a designer, um, landscape architect or, or contractor or otherwise um, to really have a plan and make sure that uh, this is where we talked about siting as well um, in the area where you are looking to have that hot tub on, you know, is that possible there or is that the best solution there or is there a, either, either if that's what the way you really want to go about it, is, is that the right space or would it be better off over here or um, this is the best space for something like that, but the construction methods are going to have to slightly change. Um, but yeah, and cocktail pools, you know, we, you know, pools of all shapes and sizes, um, you know, you'll see them all, you know, all over the place. Cocktail pools are very popular, um, you know, hot tubs, uh, lap pools. Um, so we can, you know, you can do all of that. Just uh, that's pools in general as well. Uh, definitely a permitting and zoning uh, consideration. Uh, there's a Every village has regulations with setbacks and things like that. Some villages treat pools as um, permeable, some as impermeable. So um, just a word to the wise, if you are looking to do a pool of, or of any uh, sort or at a property, um, definitely uh, give a call uh, to the village to see what you're going to need to take into account from a, a zoning and permitting standpoint, because that's a, a, a big consideration for that. Uh, then another question from Marion, uh, what considerations need to be taken if choosing wisteria for a pergola? Um, main consideration is just structural strength. Um, wisteria, everyone loves wisteria. I, I do too. Um, and they are absolutely beautiful uh, flowering vines. Um, and just look it up on, on you know, Google or whatever you want to look. You can see how um, large and strong the actual trunk of wisteria vines get over time. And if they are uh, installed on a structure that isn't strong enough, um, they as they wrap around, you know, a wood structure, they can just literally destroy it. Um, so, you know, something like a small trellis or a, a even a small pergola that just isn't built, you know, strong enough um, can actually be damaged by the wisteria over time. So, the main consideration is just make sure you have. Um, you know, probably four, at least four by four, but probably, you know, actually four by fours won't do it. Um, six, at least six by six posts um, and a structure that uh, over time is going to be able to, to um, just um, support that. And and not eat, not only from the, the actual wisteria twisting around the wood itself and kind of squeezing it over time, but uh, even just the, the overall weight over time, if you have a, a you know, beautiful wisteria vine or trumpet vine or something like that, that has, you know, grown up the posts and is covering, you know, the whole, um, the whole top portion. There's, there's a lot of weight to that, especially when it's all leafed out um, during the summer. Um, and especially if it's something that is like cantilevered um, out from a house or, you know, doesn't have a ton of um, vertical support, that's something to just uh, kind of just be mindful of and consider. Let's see what else we have here. Okay, well, it looks like those were all the questions. Um, so again, I wanted to just thank everyone uh, for setting aside the time uh, this morning um, to talk about outdoor structures. I believe this uh, um, webinar is recorded as well, so hopefully will be available uh, for future use. So again, my name is Eric Braun. I'm the Director of Design and Landscape Architect here at Chalet. Hope you enjoyed the time with us here today and happy Friday and everyone have a great weekend. Thanks. Bye.